Welcome to the Grace Writers Podcast, Christian writers changing popular culture. Hit subscribe on your favourite podcast player so you never miss an episode. And join our community at gracewriters.com. Today on the podcast, author, editor and ghostwriter, Lisa Stilwell. I'm Belinda Pollard, author, editor and book coach with degrees in theology and journalism. I write award-winning mystery novels and light memoir, as well as devotionals and non-fiction. I blog writing and publishing tips at smallbluedog.com and you'll find my creative writing at belindapollard.com. Hi, my name is Alison Young. I'm a former early childhood educator with four adult children and a passion for photography. I write contemporary romance with grace notes under the pen name Alison Joy, and you can find out more about my books at alisonjoywriter.com. Hi, I'm Tanita Bundy, speaker, teacher, blogger, and author of the spiritual warfare novel series, Armour of Light. Find out more at danitabundy.com. Lisa Stilwell is a 23-year veteran of the Christian publishing industry, working with best-selling authors, pastors, and recording artists. Her background includes the role of senior acquisitions editor for a number of top publishing houses. She has written several books and compiled The Heavens Proclaim His Glory, pairing Hubble telescope images with inspirational quotes. Lisa is married to Jeff Kingsbury, and together they have seven children and seven grandchildren. She joins us today from Nashville. Welcome to the podcast. Lisa. I'm so glad to be here. Lisa, may we ask you the rapid fire five, just some questions we have to find out a little bit more about you before we get started. Sure. Who is your target audience? Adult Christians, male and female both. And what is your main genre? Daily devotionals, gift books, memoirs, uh, Christian nonfiction, Mm, It's a lovely range. When is your optimum time for writing? You know, I read that question and it's in the morning. It's in the morning. Um, I sort of set this goal like, okay, once I get my work done, then I have the afternoon free to go kayaking or whatever. And I won't let myself enjoy the day until I get the work done. But after thinking about, I would say when I'm really at my very best is when I'm under deadline it just something in my mind clicks and I'm the most creative, the most efficient. So I've learned to set short term deadlines for myself to keep me in that, that mindset to go. So really makes a difference. I love that idea. I think I'd like to ask you a bit more about that, but we'll come back to it. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Where is your favorite place to write? I have an office in my home, in my own desk, and I close the door. I call it my hole. (laughs) It's not very romantic sounding, but I just say, okay, I'm going to go crawl in my hole now um, where I'm just in my own bubble world. And just briefly, how did you get into writing in the first place? Well, that's interesting. After years of editing and acquiring um, and compiling, I stepped down from corporate. It was about seven years ago not knowing I was going to go into freelance editorial publishing. And Dayspring called me and said um, they had just launched a gift book division and I'd been working in consulting capacity with them. And the publisher called one day and said, hey, we've got an artist. She wants to do a devotional. She doesn't know how to write. Would you ghostwrite it for us? A hundred Bible promises. And I said, Jason, I've never written before. I don't, I don't know if I can do this. And he said, Well, why don't you try? Why don't you write three or four samples and send them? And I'll be honest, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And if it does, will you? And I said, Okay, fine. So that night I wrote three or four devotions for him and uh sent them. And the next morning he said, You're hired. That's it. You're great. So that's literally how. I started writing. <laughs> Plus, I needed the money at the time, to be honest with you. It was just the time of my life. So um, like, okay, Lord, you know what you're doing. He he doesn't always keep us on the same path. I just find it interesting that you thought you couldn't write because I meet so many people who think they can't write. A lot of them, because I'm a book editor, a lot of fellow editors, they think, oh, no, that's like a whole separate thing. And um, other people who have really interesting stories to tell, and they also think, oh, no, I can't write. That's this thing out there. So I love Mm -hmm. that you took that plunge and it worked. And it's obviously been quite significant 
It has. In fact, when I finished writing that one, they asked me to do a second 100 day grace, gratitude and grace. And by the time I finished writing that one, I was in my prayer time and just said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do now? Because it's really about how he wants to use me. And that's when he gave me the idea of faith over fear, a hundred days of faith over fear, and also God's truth for troubled times. He gave me both of those titles back to back. And I am not a title person. I can't tell you how many title meetings I've been in. And I can't come up with the title. So I know it was of the Lord. And I, I sent them to Day Spring and they said, we love them both. We'll do them both. And it just kind of has snowballed ever since. It's, and I've written many more prayer books and devotionals for them since. Mm, maybe, a, do you have any tips for other people who think they can't write, even though maybe there's a little hankering to do it, they think they can't? I would say do it. Um, think of what's in your heart and and just do it and see what happens. Don't worry about editing yourself, just write. And it's amazing how as long as soon as I get a topic and a scripture and get the concept in my head, I can write in five minutes. I just I can't stop it, you know, but um, as long, so come up with the idea that's in your heart, scripture, verse, prayer, and just do it and see what happens. And I think most people would be amazed. Do you do it um, on screen or by hand when you first? Oh, I, I, on my computer. Yeah. yeah, I do my computer. You mentioned 100 Days of Faith Over Fear was personally transformative for you. In what way? My late husband suffered from Parkinson's as well as other health issues for 10 years. In fact, that's why I stepped down from corporate um, to care for him and um, got to where I could not leave him anymore. And so I stepped down in faith, a lot of prayer and support from other people. And um, here I am, you know, going from this senior level corporate position that I've been in for 20 years, stepping down and, okay, what, what Lord, I need you now. Okay. And that's, that's when day spring came along just two weeks after I'd stepped down. And when, by the time I wrote faith over fear, his health had deteriorated so much. So that, um, I just was treading water every day, pretty much, and not knowing what my future held, how am I going to care for him? How am I going to pay the bills? It was really a time of faith and overcoming my fear at the time of the unknown, just day to day, not knowing how to handle when he had a, an episode or if he fell. And every day just took so much courage and faith to face, to get through um, till the day he passed. So, and it was during that time I wrote um, that book in particular. So that, that was why. Um, actually, and I would say when when they asked me to write 100 Days of Gratitude and Grace, I was like, right, Lord, you, you've got a real sense of humor here because I was not feeling grateful at all for my situation. And yet by the time I finished writing the book, it transformed my life in that sense too. There's always something to be grateful for, no matter what you're going through. So you said before that you found setting yourself deadlines really worked because that's when you tend to write. How did that interact with that issue of being, you know, working during that difficult time with your husband's Ill illness? Did you use deadlines then or was that more a thing for other times when things are going more smoothly? How does it work for you? I absolutely did use that. I needed as much routine as I could possibly get um, in my life because caring for him wasn't so routine. Some of it was, but you just never knew what was going to spring up that day. And um, so it just get, the routine was so, I think, vital for keeping my eyes focused on just moving forward, taking the next step. Give us some tips how you actually set these mini deadlines for yourself. What do you say? Do you create carrots, you know, that if you do this, you can have that? Or how do you convince your brain that it's a real deadline? Well, first it's on paper. I'll take the whole book. If it's if it's 100 devotions and I know when the deadline is, I figure out how many do I have to do a week 
to meet the deadline. And so I have that. Of course, you have to give yourself some grace because you can't necessarily write every single day. It's just life doesn't work that way. And so the, I'll incorporate a little grace in there, but that's how I do it. Or if it's just one long book, um, it's word count. If the if the target word count is 50,000 words and I know the deadline, the, the ultimate final deadline, I back up and see how many words do I need to write a week? Because they tend to do best with a weekly goal. And by the end of the week, you know, it, it, it hopefully I've met it most of the time I do. That's when I'm like, okay, I'm going to go kayaking today. I'm going to go shopping or I'm going to go hike or whatever. So in that sense, it's a carrot. Yes, I definitely reward myself. We all need that, right? <laughs> so. And do you do you write them down like, you know, mm -hmm. visibly I somewhere? I do. I write them down and keep a schedule. I write down how many words I write each day. And so I know exactly where I am and what I need to do. If you enjoy the Grace Writers podcast and would like to see it continue, please donate at gracewriters.com. Lisa, I recently read Behind the Lights by Helen Smallbone, um, the mother of singer Rebecca St. James and the duo for King and Country, and I saw that you helped tell her story. So we're intrigued to know, to find out more about the role of a ghostwriter. Like how do, what is a ghostwriter for a start and how did you end up in this role? Well, that's another big God story. Um, uh, a ghostwriter is someone who helps someone who has a story to tell but doesn't know how to tell it. Mm -hmm. A ghostwriter um, has the role of getting to know that person's heart, find out what their story is, be courageous enough to ask probing questions, and then commit to prayer and discernment how much of what goes in the final manuscript and what isn't necessary. So it's it's sort of all these things in tandem going on at the same time, I would mm -hmm. say. It's not just asking questions and writing. Uh, it's, it's a much bigger picture for me anyway. And I got into it again. <laughs> I got it. I got an email. Uh, Kayla launched a, a book division and they needed a writer for Helen. They were, she, her book was actually one of the, it, Michael W. Smith's book was the first one and hers was the second one on their schedule. That's how new to Kayla it was. But the guy running this division used to work at Thomas Nelson and I knew him. We used to, to work in the Max of the Cato brand together. Anyway, they were trying to think of writers to contact for her to interview and my name came up. Um, and so I got a random email. Hey. Uh, help, we we're trying to find a writer for Helen Smallbone. Honestly, I didn't even know who she was. I had to look her up briefly to say, oh, okay. Um, she needs someone to write her memoirs. And um, my initial response, which is not uncommon, is, oh, no, I can't do that. And um, I, I took it to the Lord, and the Lord just very clearly said, I want you to interview. Um, no, I don't want to interview. I want you to interview. It's like this little <laughs> battle went on. So I said, okay, I'll, I'm happy to interview and did uh, over Zoom. And I gave her absolutely every reason in the world not to hire me. <laughs> I said, I've never done this before. I, I said everything, but don't hire me because I really didn't think I could do it. Plus the timing seemed wrong. My husband had just just gone into hospice at that point. And I'm like, Lord, the timing is not right. This doesn't make sense. And he clearly said, my timing is perfect. Just don't worry. I'm here with you. So I said, okay. So anyway, I interviewed and I didn't hear anything for about six weeks. And I was fine with that, right? Getting on with my life. And um, then got a, an email from uh, the publisher saying, Helen, chose you to to work with her and of course I about had a meltdown oh, oh no what am I going to do now because I just I had not done someone's memoirs before and um it was not a week or so later that my husband passed away 
Mm-hmm. And so, which was interesting timing. And um, the publisher, Dave, he saw my post on Facebook and he reached out right away with condolences. And he said, we're not on any tight schedule. Take as long as you need. Okay. And I said, okay, I will. And I needed some time. And I took three months just to self-care, to grieve and just work on the, all of all that's involved with loss. And I woke up one morning and I just thought, okay, I got to get back to work. I'm ready to get back to work. So I reached out um, on a Monday to Davis that I'm ready. And by Thursday, I was in Helen's home um, with my phone. I had never, I never recorded an interview on my phone before I literally called my old boss at Howard. I said, how do you write someone's memoirs? I'd edited a ton, right? I'd edited them, but how do you write? It's a whole different process. And she told me what she does. And she just kept saying, oh, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Like, okay. So that's what I did. And it was really, really quite interesting and fun with Helen because they have a lot of animals. They live on a farm, lots of animals inside and outside the house. And we're sitting in the living room trying to start the interview process. She had so many birds and they kept squawking and all this. There was so much noise that I couldn't do it. I just, it wasn't coming through very well. So um, she suggested we go down into her basement where the, and Helen, if you watch this or listen to this, please forgive me, but this was so, I, I love this. Um, there were piles of laundry everywhere and we had to move them over on the couch and we're just sitting, talk about informal and casual. And we spent about nine hours that day, um, just me asking questions. And by the time I left, I was definitely uh, in a panic mode because I thought it was going to be her memoirs, not realizing she was going to include the stories of meeting her husband and all of their kids' lives, all incorporated into the book. And and, uh, I I literally was, Lord, help me. Um, and so that's, that was baptism by fire, as they say. (laughs) You did very, very well. Um, once I read the book, I sort of was looking everywhere for interviews or anything. I could get some more information about the book and just, I just saw one particular interview with Helen and she said she had asked if she should show the work in progress to her family, but was advised not to. So why was that? That was not a plan. That just came up. Um, she she said she had shared, she she couldn't remember some details and different stories. And so she reached out to Rebecca or, or one of the boys and to ask them. And uh, something she said triggered in my mind, being the mother of three grown daughters, when you get together with your adult children, and you start talking and then an old family story comes up and one of them starts to tell the story. Remember when such and such happened? And then the other, another one will say, no, that's not the way it happened. And then I'm over here saying, no way, that's not the way it happened. So everybody's got their own perspectives of the same story. And I could just see a train wreck coming. Okay, <laughs> So um, and she wanted to just be so obliging to and considerate of all, well, I say kids, but I mean adult, you know, adult children. But I finally just said, you know, Helen, I think it's best that that to remember that this is your story. You can ask one of your kids and then it becomes their story. But this is your story. And I think just for that purpose alone, let's let's guard your space, including her husband, David, who has a very strong personality. Um, just it's important to let's just stay focused. I wanted to hear from her and her heart, not the rest of the family. So that was why. And it worked. And she thanked me so many times by the time we re- she said it just like freed her up. She mm. lifted the burden of feeling like she had to make sure everything was right with her kids and it just freed her up and she was able to just talk. And um, it, it, it was a, not knowing that was going to be a key point for mm-hmm. her, but it was. One of the interviews I saw with one of the boys when he read this read the book, he was interested to, to know why she picked certain stories and not other aspects. Obviously, you couldn't put everything in the book because it, you'd still be writing it. Yes, there were a lot of stories. um, And 
I did ask her, which ones do you absolutely want in the book? Mm -hmm. And she told me, and then the rest, she gave me carte blanche. She said, you, and it's really just the leading of the Holy Spirit and what made, what made sense to help highlight point to point as her, as all their stories built in the book, because that's what happens. It builds up and, and you know, finally when it becomes for King and Country and how everyone's working together. So I would say too, there's, there was a kind of a joke when we were done that I probably know more about that family than each of the family members do because there were so many stories told, but you just can't put them all in. No, it's like you need a couple more volumes follow up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested to know when you enter a project like this, and like you said, you um, you gave her um, like free reign. Do you have in your head a rough um, word count that you're aiming to? Like, is there a sweet spot that you're targeting for when you're compiling a memoir? Or do you just write and get that information until the story is complete? Like, how do you determine that? The A, a good average word count for a trade book is about 45,000 words, 40 to 45,000. I think the longer, just my, my experience in publishing, the longer the book gets, the less likely the reader is to finish. And with her, I think we went over that, um, but it still works well. And uh, the last book I wrote um, last year, we went over, but not by a lot, but starting out, you really don't know, because I don't know what they're going to tell me. Just kind of going with it and keeping track of the word count as you write and saying, okay, and try to project, you know, how many I'm averaging per chapter to get a feel along the way. So it's not like I just write and then I lift my head up later and count the words. I'm, I'm constantly monitoring. Because when you entered that project, you said you weren't aware that you were actually telling her children's stories as well. Yeah, I think that was really more my naivety my past in editing memoirs, it's been this football player or this pastor, right? With their, their stories on the side. It just, uh, I didn't see it coming that it was, this is going to be the whole family because her family is her story. And I find it interesting that she chose you, even though you felt your interview was less than Stella, she chose you. And I'm thinking maybe that's because she felt a connection with you. For people out there who may be interested in becoming ghostwriters, you know, what you might have to say about that in terms of the importance of being able to get inside the head and the heart. Very important. And that stems from my editing. It's so important that they trust you first and foremost. And, um, during the interview process, there was a definite connection with Helen, I think, because we're both mothers. And we both love the Lord. And she, one thing that she thought was that since I hadn't done it before, she thought I was going to work all that much harder to succeed. And I think she's right. You know, this is my first time. It's like, okay. And she's right. When I interview for writing jobs now, I am also, they don't know of it, but I'm interviewing them to make sure I connect with them. Cause if I don't feel it, they're not going to feel it with me. And I, I just bottom line is it's so important to have that connection and um, mainly a heart connection. And um, part of the connection process is being able, being comfortable enough to ask questions to ask and not, not being afraid to probe and most people want to talk, but they don't know where to begin and they need someone to do that for them. I would say from my years of editing, um, I've honed that craft. I've honed that skill. And I've I've gotten to the point where I'm not afraid to ask anything. And trust me, I, the, I've asked some very personal questions, not knowing. And I'll say, feel free not to answer if you're not comfortable. And I'll ask very personal questions and you know, they're just waiting to share. But yes, the connection and the trust, there has to be trust. That's sort of the core of the connection. 
And you've got to be actually writing in their voice, haven't you? How do you do that? You have to be almost a chameleon. Listen, listen, and listen. Constantly listening for key phrases and words that they might use. They're, uh, are they fast-paced talker? Are they slow? Um, I guess I'm just listening and absorbing all of that part of their personality. Are they uh, speaking seriously and they might regularly jump off on a joke and then come back? You know, I'm listening for all of those keys and remembering that. And when I transcribe the the um, recordings, I really, I hate transcribing. It's my least favorite part, but it is the most, one of the most important parts because that's when I really internalize a second time what they've said. And if I'm typing in, I have a question, I can go back and ask and get clarity, but that helps as well. It's just the process of it, but really listening to them. If they're informal and casual, I'm not going to use formal language, right? So... Do people come to you now that they've seen your work or do you look for clients to write for? I have not looked or advertised once. It's literally, okay, Lord, how do you want to use me now? And that's 100% it. Um, And being willing, (laughs) even when it doesn't make sense, but being willing. So that's how I've got my writing jobs Um, each time has come through an author I've worked with over the, in the past. There have been people where I've said, I'm not sure I'm the best person to serve you, um, but God has provided just enough, um, which is about two books a year. This is about it for me. I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not semi-retired, but I'm not working every day. Like, you know, like you do when you, when you're in corporate either. So is it draining? How do you protect yourself? Oh, that, that is how, (laughs) yes. Um, make sure I, I give myself space on the calendar in between projects because I've made the mistake of back to back and, um, it's just been trial and error and learning that the hard way. Um, so right now I'm very blessed because I took a sabbatical over the last six months And um, in fact, the pastor I'm getting ready to work with now contacted me last fall and I prayed before speaking to him and I didn't tell him I was on sabbatical. I just listened to his heart and thought, this is someone I would really like to work with. And then finally I asked him, what is your timeline? And he said, oh, I don't want to start until next spring. I'm like, there you go. It's perfect. And that's exactly what I wanted. So I know that God is in that for sure. We would like to know a bit more about the heavens proclaim his glory. How did that come about and how did you choose the contributors? When I worked at Thomas Nelson, I commuted 45 minutes each way and I listened to worship music. Each I love music. And I would there's a song by Third Day. They no longer are Third Day, but they sang a song called All the Heavens. And I listened to that song over and over and over because it would just expand my heart and mind into the vastness of God's creation up into the heavens. And at the same time, I love Hubble telescope pictures. Whenever I would see a headline, uh, I would go right to it and read about it. I spent time on the website and was just so in awe of the beautiful photographs that the telescope took. And that's when I started getting the idea of, gosh, between the inspiration from the song and um, seeing the the photos, I thought, what a beautiful idea for a coffee table book, having some very inspiring excerpts by a whole range of authors and pastors I've worked with. I've I've worked with so many. And um, I actually tried to get the idea passed at at work at Thomas Nelson for two years, and they kept turning it down. And finally, and I couldn't let it go, couldn't let it go. Finally, I, I asked my my boss at the time, look, can I have the designer create a couple of spreads on PDF or a big PowerPoint? Let me pitch it to our ed board group, which is all the VPs in the company. They have to approve any book that we want to do. And if they decline, I won't ever bother you again. And she said, okay, <laughs> thinking it wouldn't pass. Well, 
when I walked in all prepared for the presentation, it's the one and only time the CEO of the company was in that meeting. Usually it's just the VPs. Well, the CEO, my client was there and my heart beat pretty fast and it got to my turn. And when I presented it, he loved it. There was no declining. Okay. <laughs> he loved it. And so I was able to press forward. And what I did was I, I just started reaching out with our database of, of pastors and authors and started sending out emails and almost everyone I reached out to said yes, and they sent me something. So it, it was really a blast to work on a labor of love. It took me about nine months and um, it's basically my magnum opus. It's great. It's lovely. You're also a um, acquisitions editor, which is a fairly high position. Did you work up to that? Did you come into that? How did that happen? Oh, I definitely worked up. And um, after editing and editing, and, and I just, I needed more of a challenge. And so that's when I just asked, hey, can I, you mind if I reach out to this person or that person? Sure. You know, we need, we need titles that work. And I liked the new challenge a lot. I really did. And at, at Thomas Nelson, I was in the gift book division, but when I went to Howard, it was trade book and that was full fledged into the trade book acquisitions. And I loved it. I absolutely loved doing it. Mm. It's almost like a progression. Like isn't yes. it? You know, yes. from well, yes, it takes confidence knowing a good idea when you hear it. And is this the right person to talk to write about it? Um, it just takes a lot of intuitiveness, I guess, and leading of the Holy Spirit. And um, I really, really got a charge out of it. But it took time to develop that, you know, it took years actually to develop mm -hmm. it. That part was not as natural for me. And like God was moving you in that direction. Yes. You can see just that. really what it's all about. He he doesn't he doesn't develop us and just keep us there. Okay, you've you've learned this now. I'm ready to graduate you to the next thing. And isn't that the way he works? <laughs> At least yeah. it's been the way for me. <laughs> so it is not boring being a servant of the Lord <laughs> by any means. <laughs> the Grace Writers slogan is Christian writers changing popular culture. What are your thoughts or reactions to that? It's never been more needed. I, I mean, look at our culture today and the chaos and the division. And I think it's as so important as ever, not just through the written word, but by what you're doing now, because not everyone likes to read. They would rather listen to a podcast or watch a video and, um, I think it's wonderful what you're doing in, in the sense we're all just part of God's kingdom working together, however we can, to get his message of hope and encouragement and his love and uh, the forgiveness and eternal life, all of it, to anyone that we can. We never know how far-reaching what we're doing right now will be. Thank you so much for all of those thoughts, Lisa. I wish we could just keep on talking, but we're out of time. How about I pray for you before we finish? Thank you. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Lisa. We thank you uh, for all the wonderful aspects of her, her life and work with you that she has shared with us today and with the Grace Riders out there. I pray that you will bless her abundantly, that you will empower her by your Holy Spirit for this writing project that she's starting now and for all that lies in the future. I pray that you will speak through her, that you will minister to those that she writes with and for, and that you will lead her in your ways to be your person in your time in all the different situations and I pray for all the grace writers out there too who are maybe thinking that they would like to try getting into grace to ghost writing. And I pray that you will open the right doors for them and help them to be able to take it one step at a time uh, and to find the way forward into what your plan is for them and for their subjects. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lisa, where can listeners find you online? 
My website is lodestoneliterary.com, lodestone, L-O-A-D-S-T-O-N-E, literary.com. Thanks so much, Lisa Stilwell. Uh, Thank you, Danita Bundy and Alison Joy. I'm Belinda Pollard, and we will see you next time on the Grace Writers Podcast. Continue today's conversation on our blog and find useful tips, resources, encouragement and fellowship at gracewriters.com. Thank you.